While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he responded by saying, How is it that the experts in the law say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? This Jesus is the one God has raised up. We are all witnesses of that. So after he was exalted to the right hand of God, and after he received the promised Holy Spirit from the Father, he poured out what you are now seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, and yet he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool under your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who is the author of our faith and the one who brings it to its goal. In view of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God's throne. Carefully consider him, who endured such hostility against himself from sinful people, so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
On this Ascension Day, our first lesson from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 26 through 29, will also serve as our sermon text. Moses says, There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides through the heavens to help you. In his majesty, he rides through the clouds. The everlasting God is a dwelling place, and his eternal arms are under you. He drove out the enemy in front of you, and he said, Destroy. So Israel settled it down in safety. Jacob dwelt in security in a land of grain and fresh wine. And yes, its heavens drop down dew. How blessed are you, O Israel! Who is like you? You are a people saved by the Lord. The shield who gives you help. The sword who gives you majesty. Your enemies will cr come cringing before you, and you will trample on their high places. This is the word of our God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 110. You'll find it in your blue supplement hymnal on page 54 in the front. We'll join to sing this psalm, and as we do, I'll introduce the refrain and then invite you to join me in the rest of the refrains. We'll repeat the refrain. I'll also sing the verses and invite you to join me in the glory be to the Father. We'll sing together Psalm 110. Alleluia, Alleluia, praise and glory to Christ the King, Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead, and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way, therefore he will lift up his head.
In the psalm, we heard that Jesus, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, is serving as our priest. In this lesson, we see from Ephesians chapter 4, he is also serving as our prophet, continuing to give us that word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of the, fa of the gift from God, of, excuse me, measure of the gift from Christ. That is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took captivity captive and gave gifts to his people. Now, what does it mean when he says he ascended, other than that he also descended to the lower parts, namely the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. He himself gave the apostles, as well as the prophets, as well as the evangelists, as well as the pastors and teachers, for the purpose of training the saints for the work of serving, in order to build up the body of Christ. This is to continue until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, resulting in a mature man with a stature reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ. The goal is that we would no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, when people use tricks and invent clever ways to lead us astray. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we would in all things grow up into Christ, who is the head. From him the whole body, being joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows in accordance with Christ's activity when he measured out each individual part. He causes the growth of the body so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of our God. Let us stand out of respect for the gospel of our Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 44. Here Jesus speaks to his disciples. He said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, This is what is written, and so it must be. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Look, I am sending you what my father promised, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as the vicinity of Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. So they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple courts, praising and blessing God. Amen. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We'll continue with our hymn of the day, the sermon hymn, hymn 171. Please note the children of our grade school will sing the first three stanzas. We'll, we'll join to sing the final three stanzas.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from our risen, our ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God we consider again, Deuteronomy chapter 33. I'll just read verse 26 again. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides through the heavens to help you. In his majesty, he rides through the clouds. This is the word of our God. Let us pray. Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, what a festival day it is that gives Christians great cause for celebration. Ascension. Ascension is truly a day to celebrate. Because today we have an opportunity to see and to rejoice in how great our God is. We see and celebrate how unique our God is. Because in him, we find all our successes. In him, we find for ourselves one victory after another, even over our enemies. In him, we find perfect safety wrapped up in his everlasting arms. That's what ascension is all about. And so God's people gather here today to celebrate there is none like our ascended Lord. None like our ascended Lord. He makes us victorious over our enemies, and he makes us dwell in safety. These verses from Deuteronomy chapter 3, at the very end of that record of Deuteronomy, are the final words, the very final words that Moses spoke to the people before we hear in chapter four of his, 34 of his death. Now, from a purely human point of view, Moses was a great, masterful leader, a wonderful man with incredible accomplishments in his life. He took the mighty Egyptian army and, and drowned them in the sea. He liberated his people from bondage in the greatest enemy, the greatest nation of all. He carried God's, God's law to his people. Even when everyone else was afraid to go up that Mount Sinai, he went to face God and come down and speak on his behalf. Again and again, he did that to go before the face of God. He led a massive nation through the wilderness, the desert, 40 years, keeping them alive and ruling them justly. And finally, he brought them safely to the land that God had promised them for centuries to give. Outwardly, humanly speaking, Moses was a great man. Great leadership, fantastic successes. But as glamorous as Moses' life was, he wasn't the one responsible for any of it. He was not great because of himself. He was great because of his great and gracious God. And you know what? Moses knew that. As humanly successful as you could judge a person to be, Moses' goal of entering the promised land, that wouldn't even be carried out by him personally. You see, he was about to die. And the Bible says not because he was weak in health or strength. He was going to die for a seemingly simple sin of striking a rock instead of speaking to it. A simple sin of harshness of speech and incredulity. Unbelief. When patience and a firm trust in God was to be communicated to them. That's Moses. A seemingly great person, and yet we find on the pages of Scripture yet another flawed, imperfect, unworthy creature of God. 
But no, Moses knew that about himself. And more importantly, he recognized and still trusted fully in the greatness and the grace of his God. And so as he knew that this was the end of his life, in his very last words to his people, after all of his accomplishments, everything that he saw Israel through, he glorified and honored not himself, but his saving God. He doesn't boastfully speak about all the things that he did to lead the people to the promised land. No. He boasted about his God. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides through the heavens to help you. In his majesty, he rides through the clouds. That is the one who is worthy of praise. Because through him and only by his doing have we achieved anything that we have achieved. And Moses pointed that out to the Israelites, to those Israelites, the great saving works that God led him to do, giving them victory over their enemies. He, Moses says, he drove out the enemy in front of you, and he said, destroy. It wasn't Moses who stood between Pharaoh and those Egyptian chariots and those people of Israel. Even as they were breathing down the necks of the Israelites, it was the Lord in that pillar of cloud that stood before Israel and Egypt. And it was the Lord who said, destroy as those waters of the Red Sea came crashing down on Egypt. And it wasn't Moses who went off to fight against the Amorites or against the Midianites, as you can read in Numbers 21 and 31. It was the Lord who went off to fight and drove them out right in front of Israel, right in front of them, to lead them safely through and to take possession of that land east of the Jordan, which God had promised even to them, so that they could settle there. All of these conquests, all of these conquests were done by God and not by Moses. And even as God had given them victory in those conquests, that couldn't save Moses' life. Because there was a greater enemy to face. And it's that enemy that Moses had trust in God to deliver him from as well. So he could confidently say, even in his death, this is the one who rides through the heavens to help you. In his majesty, through the clouds. And about all his enemies, not just the physical enemies, but even and especially those spiritual enemies, Moses said, your enemies will come cringing before you, and you will trample on their high places. You see, Moses understood who his deliverer was. It was the Lord who had given him strength to do everything that he had done, and strength to deliver him even in the face of death, so that Moses could go and face death and know that the people would be fine as he left them there, and know that he would be fine because he would go to that place where God dwelt, up in the clouds, up with his Savior in heaven. Only by this work that anyone can be delivered from their enemies, the work that God has given to deliver. It was this saving God who kept his promise to deliver his people from their enemies, who, who ro rode through the clouds of heaven to come down to this earth. It was this saving God who in his majesty gave that up, set it aside, so that his conquering work could come through humiliation, through suffering, and through death. And Moses, as he thought of those words that God had spoken through him, to write down, he will crush your head. God spoke to Satan through Moses. He will crush your head about Jesus. Your enemies will come cringing before you, and you will trample on their high places. Today, dear friends, we celebrate that mighty return to heaven of that victorious God who did come down to crush Satan's head, to trample on top of him, 
After he had defeated all of our enemies, sin and death and even hell itself, he displayed his greatest superiority over them by triumphing in exaltation in his ascension into heaven. And dear friends, his victory over enemy, the enemies that we face is our victory over the enemies that we face. Did you notice in those closing words, Moses doesn't point out that the enemies would cringe before God, though, though they certainly do. And he doesn't say that God will trample over their high places, their haughtiness and their pride, though God certainly does. No, he says, this is what you will do. God's victory is your victory. God's defeat of enemies is your defeat of enemies. God's success is your success. Moses says to the people, your enemies will come cringing before you, and you will trample on their high places. And yet who gets the credit for such success? Who is praised and hailed on this day for bringing forth such great works? Moses trumpets God. Who is like God? There is no one like the God of Jeshurun. So often, however, we may not feel so victorious, so triumphant. After all, Moses was dying. It seems that death was victorious and he would not enter the promised land. It seems because of his sin. Dear friends, perhaps you are weary as well. Perhaps you see the struggle against your enemies, the struggle in your life, searching for a pastor, fear of dwindling numbers in a congregation, worry over the agingness of our congregations or our synod, Worrying over our own aging? Nevertheless, our victory is there because of our saving God who has indeed given us victory even over death, even over all of our enemies, even over sin itself. The Lord's victory, friends, is our victory. Yes, this would be a time of trial for Israel. God had not acted on behalf of Israel until Moses arrived in Egypt. And now Moses would be gone. And, and perhaps for the people, their trust in God would also fade. But, dear friends, God doesn't come and go like people do. God's glory does not fade like man's glory and accomplishments as we remember, it was not Moses who brought Israel out of Egypt. It was God. And it wouldn't be Moses who would bring them into that promised land of Canaan. It would be God. It was not Moses who fed them food and water for 40 years. It was God. It was not Moses who brought them to that promised land. It was God. And now it would not be Moses who would make them dwell safely in that promised land. It was always God. And it will always be God. Because as man is fleeting, fading, and mortal, just the opposite is true of our God. He is eternal. The everlasting God is your dwelling place. And his eternal arms are under you. Dear friends, there you have the most wonderful promise from God who came down in time to save us and now has ascended again to show forth that eternal nature. You see, in humiliation, he set aside that eternal nature. He chose to give it up. Give up his eternal nature and his immortality so that he could come to this earth to die. The immortal one, the eternal one, died on the cross. He laid it aside so that he could suffer under the weight of the law. He laid all of his power and glory aside with the result that he could struggle against sin and that his struggle would be real, and yet he would conquer and be victorious. He laid that as eternal God all aside to be mortal, to have an end. And then he laid it aside and died. But here today is ascension. 
And we celebrate that he, the immortal one, did not stay dead. He took back all of that glory and all of that power and all of that eternalness. And he exalted himself. The one who descended even into hell to proclaim what? Victory. And he exalted himself even in his resurrection, to proclaim victory to all those who saw him on this earth. And then he exalted himself when he ascended into heaven, so that the whole world would know that he sits in heaven at God's right hand and has all power and all authority over all things and in control of all things for your benefit. That is our eternal God. And think of the comfort that he furnishes you with here as Moses speaks, enemies surround you. Death creeps in on you as it did for Moses. It looms over us ominously. Where, where do we find shelter? Where? Where can we hide? We can hide in the eternal, loving, blessed arms of our ascended Lord Jesus. He holds us in those arms, wraps us safely in them. Those are what are underneath us. We live and we exist in our ascended Lord's loving embrace, held and protected tightly in his eternal arms. Those arms are all-powerful. Those arms are strong and mighty, and he embraces us in them for all eternity. So, Moses says, Israel will settle down in safety. Jacob dwelt in security in a land of grain and fresh wine, and yes, its heavens dropped down dew. How blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you? You are a people saved by the Lord, the shield who gives you help, the sword who gives you majesty. Jesus' victory is our victory. When he is safe and well in heaven, you know that you too are safe and well with him in heaven, even while you struggle and toil on this earth. And yet so often we find happiness elsewhere. We seek to find joy elsewhere. God's eternal arms embrace us, and there we are safe but instead of finding our joy and our comfort and our safety in those everlasting arms of God, we run to find joy in pleasure. We run out of those arms of God, that wonderful loving embrace, to find joy in wealth or earthly goods. We run out of that loving embrace, that safe embrace of our God, to find joy and pleasure in ourselves. And we give up that greatest treasure of all. We give up that greatest safety of all. We give up that greatest joy of all when we seek the God of ourself or the God of goods or the God of pleasure. And then what do we have left to show for it? Nothing. Nothing to show for all of our works and all of our success. How sad it is that here are the everlasting arms of our God and we climb out of them to pursue, our, to pursue our own interests. But dear friends, what a joy that Moses knew and understood the God who saves and also on his deathbed reminded those Israelites of that God who saves. You are a people saved by the Lord. And there is that forgiving embrace, the warm and welcoming embrace of a God with eternal arms whose love is also eternal and extends to us even in spite of our sins. Those arms stretched out in love to die in pursuit of pleasure, for sins in pursuit of pleasure or wealth or self-glory. And now those arms stretched out to you in love calls you to repentance, calls you to faith in his forgiveness and faith in his perfect and his eternal safety. Dear friends, where can we find such a God? Not in the pleasures of this world, not in earthly goods, 
not in ourself. All of those gods fail. There is no God. There is no God who gives us such perfect victory over all of our enemies, even over our sins themselves. There is no God. There is no God like the Lord who holds us safely in his everlasting arms. What a day to celebrate our ascended Lord. Who is like him? There is none. Let us rejoice and give him praise and glory. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering. We'll use the responsive prayer of the church as it's printed in your worship folder. Blessed Jesus, you ascended to the right hand of your Father's majesty, power, and glory, and now you reign as eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. O ascended prophet, Equip your church to proclaim the precious gospel message of God's love for all the world. O oh, ascended high priest, represent us before the Father as his own dear children and heirs. Defend us against Satan's every accusation. Ask for the Father's rich blessings in our everyday lives. O ascended King, direct the affairs of governments and nations that they may serve the best interest of your church. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. As the disciples lifted their eyes to watch your ascension, so lift our eyes daily to look for your coming again in glory. glory 
and we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And receive the blessing from our ascended Lord Jesus. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Well, good evening. Welcome to you all. Glad that you could all be here to worship as we celebrate this great victory that our God has for us, ascended into heaven to assure us that victory is ours too. Thank you to the children of our grade school, first, second, fourth grade, for beautifying our worship with your song, and to the teachers who, who work so diligently with them as they, as they teach and continue to do so, uh, teaching those wonderful truths to the children. I have no other announcements, so God richly bless the rest of your evening and, and the rest of your week.